everyone. Welcome to movement three of the Yellow House book discussion. I'm Megan Holt. I'm the executive director of One Book, One New Orleans. For those of you who are new here, welcome. It's so nice to see you for the first time. And for those of you who are returning, it's so nice to see you again. So for those of you who are new, there's a little spiel about One Book, One New Orleans just to tell you who we are and what we do. One Book, One New Orleans selects one book every year, and we encourage everyone in the city of New Orleans to read the same book at the same time, with the idea that we're gonna to come together and be a stronger community if we have a shared reading experience. But in doing that, we have to recognize that approximately 27% of the adults in this city are functionally illiterate. And so if we're going to be One Book, One New Orleans, we really have to do an extra layer of outreach to make sure that those folks who would normally be outside of a community of readers get a chance to be included. So we develop a curriculum around the book and we give out free of charge every year hundreds of copies to adult education programs, to high set programs, to adult ESL programs, to incarcerated adults and teenagers. We also get the book into the ears of the blind and print handicapped through a partnership with WRBH Reading Radio. And we make sure that if you can't read, but you can't afford to buy the book, that each branch of the public library has a few copies so that it's accessible to you. And then during this pandemic, we've also been collecting and distributing just other books all across the community. So far, it's been over 4,000 because we're becoming sort of the access point for books to people whose main source of books used to be public spaces like libraries and schools. When those shut down, folks found themselves in need and we were able to fill that need through the generosity of the community. And now that the pandemic is coming out, hopefully, we're gonna be hosting in-person family friendly events, but if not, we'll keep doing virtual events every month to bring our community together around a shared reading experience. Y'all can see the hand of my office assistant in the corner here. He is five and he likes to play with my hair. So thank you for being patient and in understanding we're all working from home. Mom. And without further ado, we could not be anything as an organization without our volunteers including volunteers who have offered to lead book discussions. Tonight's discussion leader is Caroline Bergeron. Caroline works at Garden District Bookshop, and when she's not doing that, she has the In Bed With Books Book Club. And I'm going to be quiet now and turn this over to Caroline for tonight's discussion. Yay. Okay, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a little power presentation that hopefully my cat doesn't jump in front of. Let's see. All right. Okay. So we are on to movement three tonight, um, which is titled Water for pretty obvious reasons, but we will get into that a little bit more. Um, to start off this section, Sarah gives us three quotes to frame the movement which I personally love a good quote or quotes to frame our chapter or section. Um, it not only gives us a good idea of where Broom dug for research, but also gives us different voices and expressions for the same things that she's expressing in her own voice. Um, these are great quotes. I don't think I'm going to read them all to you right now, but keep these in mind as we go through the discussion because each seems to me at least to coincide pretty directly to um, at least one, if not all of the chapters. Um, and I also want to bring specific attention to the title water and why it is capitalized in a lot of places in this chapter. Um, it's an you know, obvious choice as to why it's titled water because water plays a huge part in what happens here. But I wanted to ask you all why you think she specifically chose to be proper for water in this movement in these chapters. And in the book. Anyone's welcome to unmute. But I can also say 
for me, at least I thought that it's a force that dictates the language of time. So it seems to be something that should be proper. Um, it's distinguished from the element as a whole because it refers to the, you know, the levees breaking. And I suppose the storm itself, I think any kind of water that was associated with this event, she refers to in the capital. Um, and it's kind of a, almost a divine force so she gives that that power by giving it the capital W, like how Carl ascribes it to his ailments as the water, it's the cause of those. So those are a couple instances where you, know, you can see why that she, why she did that. Anyone have any other references or thoughts to the capitalization? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it is more encompassing than just naming the storm because the storm wasn't really the only problem. So yeah. if we consider the levees and the government and everything else that the water was really just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was more. Right. Yep. Yeah. Lower and upper mm -hmm. case water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually felt like um, she made water um, its own character almost like a person, like it's a character. That's why it gets the capital letter, just like people's names. That's the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. Almost like, this is maybe unfair, but almost like the antagonist of this right. story that mm -hmm. she's telling, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna head into the first chapter, which is titled Run. Um, very geographically specific here which I appreciate and I think it does, you know, does well for the, the book itself. But the subtext of this chapter is all of the places where her and her siblings were the night before the storm hit. Um, and I wanted to show that here on the map just so we have an idea of how far they are and just where they are because she pays such specific attention to setting. And she switches to present tense for the next couple of chapters and I was wondering why y'all think she made this narrative choice and if you think it helped the telling of these stories or not. Yeah, well, I thought um, it gives the immediacy to the events that are happening. So you kind of like you're going through it with her and her family. I agree. I, I think it puts you in in their stories, in their shoes very well too, to do that. Okay. Well, for this next question, it's more of a personal question, but so the setting is pretty exact. Um, do you remember where you were when the storm hit? And do you think you could sum up that memory as clearly as Broom seems to? So I was living in Virginia at the time, but I had actually visited New Orleans for the very first time two weeks before Katrina hit. Um, it, well, it wasn't quite two weeks, but I remember visiting with my family and we were all talking about how high the water was. Um, you know, we could see it was high. Uh, my brother was taking pictures of different places and we're like, stop wasting film. You know, this was back when we had the old camera, you know, we had a limited number of pictures. Um, and so afterwards, I just remember being like, just feeling uh, just, I, I can't even describe it, but it was just for me to only have visited once. And then for two weeks later to see it all, it was just like a personal a connection for me it's like all of a sudden I was watching the news all the time because I was like I feel like I know these people I was just there I, I saw them so it, I remember everything like clearly for like the, my first trip and then two weeks later seeing it all on tv all right yeah that is must be a big transformation that you witnessed but uh, do you can I ask if you live here now or are you tuning yes. in from? Okay. Yes, I'm actually here now. Um, and when I uh, said I was moving here, everybody was like, that New Orleans must have really made an impression on you because I had only been here once 
for mm-hmm. two days and then I just decided to move here, you know, um, I think six years later. So, mm-hmm. yeah. That happens. That definitely yeah. happens to people. Yeah, yeah I, I can mean, say that I definitely, <laughs> I remember where I was and, um, uh, you know, it's one of those things, I don't know, it's like, kind of, you know, I kind of wish you could forget, you know, um, but, uh, and I just want to say like this section was like the hardest to read, you know, being from New Orleans and having experienced it, uh, I thought reading it would be easier than like watching the footage because I still can't watch the footage. <laughs> But uh, even reading about it, it's like it's the similarities and like, you know, I, I could really relate to that, even though I wasn't, um, I had evacuated before the storm, but I had family who hadn't. So, and though she talks about like losing contact with her mom and stuff like that. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, and um, I think for me, it just really hit home when I saw my neighborhood on the news underwater. It was like, Oh, like, like everybody just got quiet. No one, no one said anything for like the longest time, you know. Yeah, and we're about to talk more about that experience in the next chapter because that's a big, you know, a big thing. I think that next chapter and the chapter after that, putting it in the family scene. Uh, does anyone have any? This is a really short chapter, but does anyone have any thoughts? Final thoughts about the run? I think it's about maybe two and a half or three pages, but it's an impactful chapter. I mean, as you said, this movement is a lot. Okay, we'll go on to the second chapter, which is survive. Um, And I wanted to put this quote here, Uh, the Mississippi on one side, like Pontchartrain on the other, um, the city in between water. They were in between water. Um, So here she does not use the proper water, which as we talked about earlier, was because it refers to a specific antagonizing force of water. Um, And it's, this chapter is broken into each member's account of where they were at the time, which is a pretty straightforward choice in narration. Um, And she makes a note that the span of time in this chapter is eight days. Um, She does not have contact with family members for quite a while. And it obviously, gives her a lot of stress and anxiety but there are certain things while she's in Harlem that remind her of home like she has at one point she says my loud mouth neighbors remind me of home which I thought was yeah <laughs> I, I can see that being a thing um, but have you ever lived away from home and what elements of that place conjure the feelings of home especially if home for you is New Orleans did you find certain little things like loud neighbors bringing you back here. So yeah, I'm currently not in New Orleans. I live in uh, the Bay Area in California right now. Um, Yeah, I can definitely like relate to that. Like when I hear people talking loud or playing music loud or doing anything like outside Mm -hmm. um it reminds me of home because before I was in California I lived in Connecticut and I was like why do I feel so weird here and I realized like everybody like nobody did anything outside like nobody played music loud nobody talked loud it was like like outside was quiet and I was like this is not what I'm used to (laughs) that is a big thing people playing music in their yards or just like sitting in the yards talking yeah that's a that's a big thing here, which I love. It definitely makes you feel not alone. And yeah, it gives you a better sense of who you're living around, which is great. Um, so in this chapter also, she puts us in the room um, with a lot of her family members, but until she really gets to know what's happening with them, she, as stated earlier, she was very stressed out and wanting to know if everyone was okay. So you can share, you can just reflect on this, but if there is something that brings you comfort in a time of unknowing, like how did you cope with that? I think she coped with it. I think just by working, I mean, I know she was going to work and probably trying to distract herself with that whenever she could, but this probably won't be a shocker, but whenever 
Um, I need to be confident. I always read. I don't care what's going on. I'm like, let me grab a book and I'll think about it in five hours. Like, I, I just need a break from whatever is bothering me or whatever is going on. Um, in that in that moment uh, and I don't care like what's going on around me like I, I'm like I, just give me a moment to, to just kind of think so that's my comfort zone relatable it's, it is a great escape to pick up a book and be lost in the book yeah mm -hmm. For me, actually, um, the answers to both the questions you just posed are the same, and that's food. What elements of a place make you feel at home and also what brings you comfort? It's food. Uh, you know, you always feel at home no matter where you are if someone invites you in and puts a plate in front of you. It is so comforting. It And in those moments of uncertainty during Katrina, I remember... Um, going back to Alabama and, you know, just people inviting me in and feeding me and sitting there and watching the news. And that's the same thing when I get a really good plate of food, especially Mexican food that reminds me of my mom's house. Just, it feels like home. Great answer. It's definitely another thing that I think a lot of people would agree on too. Um, and in this chapter, we do hear, I think, a transcription of what her conversation was with Carl. And it's, she has her other family members' accounts as well, but he really has the spotlight in this chapter. Um, and he hits so many points for like the Katrina survival story, the stranded on the rooftop, witnessing the convention center, the prison, the airport, the armed rescuers, the aides from neighboring states. So I feel like he gets a lot of, his story gets a lot of attention for those reasons and for Broom's connection with her brother. I feel like they have a really strong brother-sister connection. Um, and then she ends the chapter by ruminating on the fact that of whether or not her grandmother with Alzheimer's had any understanding of what was happening as she was being evacuated. And I wanted to ask how powerful is place to you when it comes to home? Because she really emphasized whether or not her grandmother knew that her home was being left behind or that she was moving away from her home. And if, when you move, does home move with you or does it stay where it is? I think, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering this question correctly, if there's a correct answer, but like, no I guess I think of, <laughs> right, I'm thinking about like specific places like that are, you know, distinct for me, like favorite restaurants or favorite, you know, um, like I miss City Park a whole lot. That's, that was my thing. Cause like you mentioned about what brings you comfort and I like to go for walks. I like to be around trees and, and, and nature. And so, um, City Park is one of those places where it's like, I, you know, I can go to other parks, but it's, but it's not City Park, you know? <laughs> so that's like, I associate that in, in other places, like certain places, uh, certain neighborhoods and whatnot, you know, um, certain people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole book really poses that question a lot of what, like how important is place to home? So I think places are, yeah, very indicative of how you feel or how comfortable you feel and what kind of memories you have there. And yeah, no wrong answers. Anyone, please do not think they're wrong answers. Um, she also has this quote at the very end of the chapter. She says, Van Gogh said yellow is the color of divine clarity. And when I read that, it made me consider all the yellow in the book. So did anyone, did this quote strike you? Did you interpret this quote in regard to the chapter itself or to the yellow house? And she said it because her grandmother was on a school bus being evacuated to, I believe, Texas. Um, and she was just thinking of the clarity that her grandmother may have had or the clarity that anyone may have had at this moment. But if this quote strikes anybody, let me know.
not, I'm going to move on to chapter three. All right, and this chapter is entitled Settle. Um, so first off, what do we make of the title? How do you how do you think she's using the word settle? Because there's a couple different meanings that this could have, but what do you what do y'all think she was really posing here? Yeah, I guess it was that time. Um when you know realizing like okay we need to figure out like what we're gonna do like i know for my family like it was a, like everybody was scattered and it was like do we look for jobs do we look for places our own you know our own places to live and or do we wait and you know so having to make those decisions like you know because i mean we just kind of ended up where we ended up like you know i was in kentucky and then i was in tennessee and it was like i don't know these places and you know do you try to like start a life there or are you just like on hold you know indefinitely yeah i think it's about making peace with where you are um i've moved around a lot and everybody say have you settled down yet and i'm like not quite you know i just don't feel at peace where i am you know content but um i i think you're well for me i'm i'm always looking for that that peace do I feel at peace wherever I'm living at in that moment? And, you know, um, sometimes it's yes and sometimes it's a no. And then if I feel the answer is no, I'm like, okay, it's time to start looking for the next place to move to. So that's what it meant for me. All right. Yeah. And then I included this picture because this is where most of her family does relocate for the time being. Um, and they were all there trying to process it together, but Broom was assigned by, I believe it was O Magazine or, you know, Oprah's Magazine to write a story about what had happened. So her being in the position of journalist, do you think she had a lot of time to process the new realities or how do you think that would have been for her? And this quote that she said she had to hide in the bathroom to write into a notebook instead of feeling because she put her job first, you know? I would say, speaking from the position of a filmmaker, whether it's a notebook or a camera, it's a shield. And um, Actually, Kalamu Yasalam talks about this too, about, you know, in the movement, there are those who are actively part of the movement, which, you know, we would consider the activists. And then there are those who are documenting the movement and they're overlapped, yet they're distinctly separate. So yeah, when, when I read this part, I felt that separation and that feeling of like, putting down that notebook could mean slipping into all those feelings. And that could be incredibly overwhelming. So in a way, it's like having that notebook and being in charge of documenting these stories is also a way to, um, to avoid letting those feelings erupt within yourself or within herself. I agree with that. And not not to psychoanalyze Sarah Broom, but we'll get into also how maybe that, not that she didn't have a good, like she was the person to write this story and the story I'm sure for the magazine, but I feel like for her own processing, it probably wasn't the best thing to be trying to make a story out of life as it was still unfolding. Um, she did a fantastic job of it, but we'll talk more about it and what happens later. Um, and I thought it was also interesting for everybody to be, I think settle meant they are settling into the reality, their new realities. They're all in this about month span for this chapter that they're all in this house together and they're all watching the news and 
comforting each other and kind of it's really sinking in and settling into the fact that they don't have a home to go back to and they don't know there's so much uncertainty still so they're settling into maybe accepting that um but this is a question if anyone wants to answer it or i'm just posing it if you've ever been displaced did you feel like that displacement defined you or defines you she was talking about how herman was calling into local radio stations and just kind of taking advantage of this story and you know exploiting the situation to gullible radio stations and melvin who was in a new school was called louisiana by his football team so they were i feel like in at least that place defined a lot by their displacement and since she wasn't sticking around the whole time to make a life there i was just wondering if anyone had any thoughts or insights to share yeah i can remember um after the storm like i, I like like a lot of people i had like a lot of health problems right like right after the storm i guess the stress and everything and i remember going to a clinic in tennessee and you know it was this big issue with my paperwork like they were like How what do you mean you don't have income and this and that and yada yada and my friend who was with me she was like well she's from new Orleans, she's from katrina and i was just like kind of upset and kind of embarrassed like i was like i'm not trying to like you know yes i'm proud of where i'm from but in this context i didn't want to like you know uh get any special treatment or be you know because it was just like at that time i just remember it was really embarrassing a lot of times when people would find out and people want to hug you or, or just all the questions which she mentions right in the book and it's just like you know just not wanting to talk about that and not be defined you know in that way because knowing those definitions weren't correct and like you know whatever people were going to think of you bit whether you uh whether you had evacuated or whether you um you know were a, a quote-unquote refugee or whatever you know it's just like all of that was just like i didn't want to have to deal with any of that so yeah do you i mean do you feel like it still defines you or you feel like that is outgrown or people don't oh yeah no i don't feel that way anymore um i mean i felt it again and not not and not in a new orleans con in a different context i should say when i um when i lived in connecticut like, as i mentioned before that was more of a, a culture shock than anything else i've ever experienced um so uh i, I felt you know because i guess within the in the context of katrina at least I knew I wasn't the only one. Everybody was going through the same experiences wherever they were. Like I was on the phone with family all the time and they were going through the same things. But then, <laughs> so most, most recently in Connecticut, like that was about a year ago, I felt like an alien and I was like, I just, I hated it. <laughs> you know, where's New Orleans? Where they, you know, people who didn't even know, you know, so it was, uh, you know, stuff like that, yeah. but I hadn't thought of it like that until you said it but that might be why I got back to New Orleans as fast as I could after Katrina because it was the one place I didn't have to talk about Katrina all day yes <laughs> everyone knew what you went through no one wanted you to talk about it because we all went through the same thing and there was a comfort in that mm -hmm. in not having to be the Katrina girl 24 7 yes absolutely <laughs> Okay, then we get to the next month. Um, she ends the last chapter on the defined date of September 29th, which is when she gets the news that her grandmother has passed. Um, and during this time, of course, city organizations and institutions and businesses are all in a scramble to figure out how to navigate the loss and destruction. Um, and then Broom and her family get to experience this disarray firsthand by trying to organize a service for their grandmother. Um, do you think there's any silver lining to this second tragedy to happen? You have to look at it from that light. And it would be really tough to experience two big losses for a family within this span of time. But did you think Because I looked at it as 
I don't know what other immediate reason they would have all had to gather back in New Orleans other than as tragic as it is like an immediate family member's death but it seemed like after experiencing such a tragedy like Katrina they could all get together and that might be comforting I don't if anyone had any similar or different perspective on it. I think too, it gives them maybe, and I'm, I'm just projecting, but a, like a, a, a proper um, reason and time to grieve, you know, like, like maybe you are embarrassed to, to be cut by how you're impacted by, you know, displacement and the, and the storm and, and the destruction. And you feel like, you know, I know for a lot of people, you know, like that was the first time I saw my dad cry and, you know, and he, he was embarrassed by how emotional he was, you know, so, but it's like in the case of someone actually passing away, it's like, oh, I can throw my grief into that and that's acceptable, you know, and that may, you know, have been the case for some of them, I'm not sure, but. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. I never even thought about that. Um, how the second tragedy would affect them but um yeah i could see that as a uh, as a way to grieve without realizing it i mean because that was a, like a lot of losses like very close together but it was also a chance to come home and celebrate the people who survived so i guess it could be like a little dual thing going on there Um, and this, when Ivory May is reflecting on her mother's death too, she says, by not seeing me every day or seeing some familiar face, she just gave up. That was one of her theories as to why her mother would have passed um, so suddenly. Um, do you think there's any truth in this statement? Do you believe that regular contact with family could be life-saving? I definitely think regular contact with family can be life-saving. Um, I'm the only one here in this area and all the rest of my family is somewhere else. Um, but whenever I feel like I'm just getting a little scatterbrained, I just go home and I'm around my family and it's just like, it's almost like a reset. I'm like, okay, familiar faces, familiar energy, I can do this. And then I you know, come back here and I can do it again for a couple of more weeks or months. Um, so I, I do think seeing a familiar face helps. It keeps you grounded a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, agree, for, definitely. <laughs> especially for such a big family. Okay, so chapter five here is Trace. Um, rather than asking how you interpret this definition, I just have the definition right here. Um, so it's a minute and often barely detectable amount or indication, a mark or line left by something that has passed, path, trail, or road made by the passage of animals, people, vehicles, a sign or evidence of some past thing. So this chapter title seems pretty apparent, but then we get to this great line that she has on the first page of this chapter remembering as a chair that it is that it is hard to sit still in so what do you think broom means by this how did y'all when y'all ran across this line what was your first thought about what she meant with this remembering can be really uncomfortable I was gonna say the same thing. It's painful. I feel like I like a hard chair after a while. It's like I gotta get out of this chair. <laughs> you need to find a bed to lay down in or something. Um, and in this chapter, like their actual actions, they since they are back home for the funeral, they take the chance to go to the house, to the house that Carl was at whenever he was stranded, and to the graveyard to visit their fathers. Um, and they see the house that is split in two, just as Herman said, and that the yellow siding has fallen off 
to reveal the old siding, which was green, um, and how the addition that her father made had split from the old structure. So do you think seeing the state of the house affected Broom's view of her family's current state? And maybe in context of tracing and how memory is, how it, I think this chapter was a lot about how memory is hard to grapple with and how it reshapes over time, depending on your perspective, which like life is not set in stone, which changes a lot. So um, how maybe seeing a physical structure, like the representation of what her family is with the, um, remarriage and different children and all of the children and all the memories and how long standing the house was but how did you how did you think she came off in this chapter like what kind of emotions did you feel from her mostly Well, like with with both the title trace and and the house being physically split in two you know, it's a very clear delineation of the before and after. This was our family before, this is our family after, our house before, our house after. And personally, like this was me before, and you know, this is me after. And what does this look like? And how do I rebuild from this? I'm over here completely dorking out about the word trace because that's what I do. I dork out about words because until you put it as a noun, I've been thinking about this as a verb the whole time, like how you mm, put a yeah, like piece trace. of paper over something and trace it. Yeah, like I'm completely changing my interpretation of everything in this chapter, trying to think of it as a noun right now. <laughs> And it's kind of blowing my mind because yeah, I've been thinking about it as like maybe trying to capture something, but you know, you can't cause the lines mm -hmm. are faded and maybe you can't get the detail you would in the original cause you're just tracing it and it's a copy. Cause the original for some reason is not doing it for you. I don't know, but yeah, I'm completely uh, blown. That also applies though. Like that's, that's a great interpretation too. I think, uh either form of the word definitely works and i like how you know with each chapter in this movement it's one word and i love that to give us a strong starting to each to each um, little section and then trace to erase um, which is tearing down the house which is a pretty short chapter pretty straightforward as well um how the, the notice was sent to the dilapidated house, how the notice was addressed to Miss Bloom, how she says a metaphor for much of what New Orleans represents, blatant backwardness about the things that count. So have you ever had personal experiences that relate to this statement, blatant backwardness? I'm sure everybody has but if you can think of one that you'd like to share, go ahead. So I, I can't think of anything in my personal life, but I do remember thinking, reading the book, like, how much sense did it make to send a letter to a house that you're getting ready to tear down because it's unoccupied? Like, I, that was definitely blatant backwardness. It, it was the, you know, no one is living there. Why would you send a letter there to tell them that they needed to do something with the structure? So that was the one that when I read it, I'm like, yes. It, it was almost like they did it on purpose, knowing no one would get it. So that was the way I read it. To Miss Bloom. Victoria Bell South tried to charge me money for my phone when my house had no walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, like it has no walls, but you know, your service was restored when we restored service to the area. 
but my house has no walls. Hmm. Hmm. That checks out. But also, I was my immediate thought outside of Katrina was just the sewage and water board of today. I feel like <laughs> I see a lot of faces made. Yep. So that that was my first thought as a prime example of the city's backwardness. And there are many other things structurally, and but that was my first like city institution service provider that doesn't provide a very good service. Um, let's see. And also, I don't really have any questions for these two quotes, but I really like these two quotes. Um, Water will find a way into anything, even into a stone, if you give it enough time. Um, so it'll seep, it'll morph into whatever it so chooses. And I guess this is kind of going back, but I know how she separates the book into movements. And I feel like that's ascribes to symphony or music a lot. But my first thought, whenever I saw movement, I did think of water itself because it is often defined by how it moves. Like you categorize it by how it moves. If it's like a river, a wave, if it's in a storm, if it's coming from the sky. I felt like water and movement worked really well together. So I don't know if she's explicitly ever said why she chose movement and if it is music, but I like to interpret it as water. If anyone else had that same thought, a water is moved and it's shaped. No, if not, that's fine. And um, how the house in this chapter was you know, she really directly points out that it's like directly related to her father. And she's all, it's always the representation there of like the addition of the house and what the house means to her and how it holds the family together. And its absence is a big hole from her life and from their lives. All right, and then we have the longest chapter in this movement, jam-packed with a lot of goods. Um, it is titled Forget. Let's open it with the great quote that she pulls, my memory stammers, but my soul is a witness. Um, so we are going to slightly psychoanalyze Sarah. I don't know if this is, I, I just have to ask, what do you think she was searching for in all of her world travels? I know she was escaping in a way, but what did y'all, what did y'all think? I think she was just trying to find her place. Um, and I say this from somebody who moves around a lot where, I, I don't know, I just feel like the, the, the world is just so large and there's so much to see and there's gonna be a place that when I step on, I'm gonna know that this is where I am supposed to be. So I just keep searching. I just keep moving. And sometimes I I feel like I'm in the right area, just not in the right location. So like even here, I moved from like Kenner to Metairie to Metairie and I'm just moving around because I'm like, I, I know it's here somewhere, but at some point I'm going to find where my soul um, feels peace. And that's what I felt like um, when I was reading Sarah's story. Where, um, she wanted to find her place in life. I agree. Yeah, and I got the feeling like maybe she didn't really know what she was searching for either. Like, I mean, she kind of has the official thing that she says about the, uh, I forget how she said it, but connecting with other um, global struggle space, I'm trying to remember what, how she said it, global, global oppression, right? She compares New Orleans to Burundi and, you know, um, and uh, black people, how black people, you know, are around, around the world are treated. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I could, I could relate, I could understand like that feeling of like, maybe I just need to get away and, I, and I'll figure things out and get away from New Orleans, get away from family you know, some, and, and be alone and figure things out. And sometimes you realize that, you know, in, like in her case, like this is, you know, this isn't it. I need to go back to my family to, you know, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think she did want to create that distance. Um, I did pull some quotes here. So I do think a part of it too, and I could be wrong, but I feel like she had some like survivor's guilt for not having been there in the first place, um, but not having to had to run from anything in the first place. So maybe she was moving and trying to distance and also forget what she wasn't there for maybe. And also, like you're saying, trying to connect on a global scale of, you know, connecting with the people of Burundi and their similar, uh, similar situations. And as she says here, I was also finding I can admit now anthropological academic language for the urge to distance myself from the fate of my family, which of course is my fate too. So grappling with that and maybe her adventurous spirit as well <laughs> was also a factor because taking a job in Burundi for the RPA is a pretty major leap. So I just wanted to address why y'all thought she made such a dramatic leap too. Did you notice any commonalities between Burundi and New Orleans? Yeah, definitely when she says it's like the, the stepsister of Rwanda, like everybody knows about Rwanda and what happened there, but no one knows that Burundi um, faced, you know, um, something even worse, right? Because um, it's weird, I think, in New Orleans, like people, a lot of people know about it, but very few people really know about New Orleans outside of like the touristy parts, you know? Yeah. So, I, um, and I've experienced that um, traveling outside of the United States where people don't know about New Orleans or Louisiana. You know, it's not, it's not New York, it's not uh, Los Angeles or some big city that globally people are familiar with, you know? So I could, yeah, I definitely saw that commonality. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also thought the way she talked about the East in Movement One, how everyone's like, oh, where's that? And then she has to tell people like, oh, it's near the French Quarter, like this far away. The way that Burundi was described as right next to Rwanda, was that was a really cool connection she made. Mm -hmm. that, that was funny. That made me think um, I had a friend one time visiting from New York and he was like, oh, I love New Orleans. I come here all the time. And he uh, gave me a ride home. I lived in New Orleans East. And he was looking around. He's like, are we still in New Orleans? <laughs> I was like, I thought you loved New Orleans. <laughs> you say you come here all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, other than, you know, she explicitly talks about like the colorism, the heat, the types of people she met that reminded her of people back home. Um, but this was, you know, the most direct statement that I feel like she had um, in comparison, how it was the greatest place on earth, you know, the native thought, but it was always passed over for funding and attention, which is also as a whole for Louisiana. Um, but yeah, so there were a lot of similarities. And then she was brought back to New Orleans, inevitably. She gotta, gotta come back, leave, but she gotta come back. Um, so what did you make of this title to the chapter? What meaning did you give to it? Other than it being the street of City Hall. In what ways was she or her situation or the people around her lost? I think in some ways it can kind of speak for all of New Orleans and New Orleanians at that time, just trying the, the, the rebuilding, what was the, you know, all the, what's New Orleans gonna be now, you know, the whole new New Orleans foolishness and all of that, you know, so it was, um, we were all trying to figure out, you know, um, how to rebuild, like in a actual physical sense, but also mentally and spiritually and everything else, you know. Yeah, and kind of riffing off that, um, it's the only chapter that's a different language. Perdido means it's Spanish. And so I think there's a way in which like coming home, because even though she's coming home, it kind of feels foreign to her in a way. 
And even people say you're not from here to her. And she's going, what? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's, it's a layered title. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's definitely works on a couple of levels. I feel like, you know, her mom was so surprised to hear that she was coming to work for this particular mayor. And she was kind of surprised by it too, it seemed like. So I feel like she felt maybe a loss for her sense of self by working for this problematic mayor and or she was just trying to find what was lost, trying to help her mother's secure a new home. I feel like she really went into the belly of the beast to do that for her mom, trying to push along all the paperwork and everything. And I feel like this is like maybe the ultimate way to be there for your city is being in the government, in the city government to see what kind of change is actually happening and if you can influence it in some way. Um, I feel like she was trying to get her footing. So she was lost and trying to get her footing there. But I was very curious if anyone has any memories of the Nagan election and what it meant to you. Because I was not living in the city and too young to know what was going on with the mayoral candidates. But he sounded like quite a character. So I wanna know if anyone has any good memories of following this. I was just gonna say Go I remember following it um, from Virginia and I just remember being like super super surprised that you know this elected official got on TV and actually said what I think a lot of um, black people were thinking you know like it was it was a black city and I was just like oh my goodness I love him because he actually said <laughs> it was more of a I guess I can kind of say I'm kind of like the anti-establishment person. Like if anybody's saying anything that goes against what is normal, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so brave. So I just remember being really, really, really surprised. Um, also not surprised by the downfall, but I was really surprised that, you know, he actually did that on national <laughs> or said it in public. Um, so that was my, my moment when I was just like, oh, New Orleans is different, different. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Latoya, you definitely sound like a New Orleanian saying different, different. You know, you know, that's, <laughs> I've been here long oh, enough different, now. Different, different, yeah. different. Yes. I, and it's funny because I, I remember that too. My, my stepmom, who is uh, West Indian, she's from Trinidad, she was cackling laughing when he said that about Chocolate City. She was like, that's my mayor. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you're right. He said what everybody, you know, like, I don't, I don't, it's, and to me, it's like, I get it that these are controversial things to say, but it's like, really, is it? I mean, come on, this is New Orleans. What are y'all talking about? Like, you're not supposed to say what everybody already knows. <laughs> but, but some of it, I feel like it was the, because he was, he said it with the sense of pride versus when a lot of people want to refer to it, it's almost like a negative, like, oh, it's, poor and disadvantaged and it's primarily minority it's almost said as a negative but when he said it it was the with pride and I think that kind of rubbed a lot of people wrong um that was my yeah. personal opinion of it at least and you know what's funny is uh what's her name Governor Blanco when she said um the poor are welcome back in New Orleans that boiled my blood and it boiled a lot of like black New Orleans blood because we know what poor is supposed to be a stand-in for and it was just like to, you know, for, I just remember a lot of people being like, you know, uh, welcome with what, you know, like, are we, are we talking about financial welcomes? Like, you know, cause that wasn't happening, you know? So it's funny that he get, you know, got caught a lot of flag for that, but, and I, and I, don't, I don't remember if she did, but it was like, you know, that I remember a lot of people being really hot about that and just lively, you know? Yeah, definitely coded. But I feel like his use of the, the word chocolate, I feel like is what maybe grabbed people's attention mostly. Like, do you think it would have been received differently if he said a black city at the end of the day? Well, then he really would have been mad, I think. 
Okay. Yeah, I feel like he <laughs> really about steak. <laughs> literally sugarcoated it by referring to it as chocolate. Yes. So I thought he sounded like a very interesting mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree. I mean, everything you love about New Orleans is because of Black people, and he was acknowledging that for sure. So, and she was in it. And I feel like she had a lot of, how did y'all feel about the way that she reported on like working in the office? Because she describes him on a lot of personal levels, like his behavior outside of meetings, I suppose. I don't know. Do you think she was objective or how did y'all feel about this chapter? And what do you think were her Inex- what was her inexplicit goal when she took the job rather than just making a living in her home city being a writer well I mean I guess I'll just say I, I appreciate it um you know like I've never met Ray Nagin but it was like I could believe you know like everything that she was saying about him and um I can't remember if she mentions it or not but I mean I feel like, and I'm not trying to defend him or anything because I don't, you know, but um, to be mayor of New Orleans at that time, you know, after, you know, being the mayor of New Orleans during Katrina and then afterwards, he, you know, the, his, I guess it comes off as like defensiveness um, of the city and of his role and everything. So I think she kind of like, now without saying it, but like talks about like the pressure that he's facing, you know, to try to be professional in this, you know, the so-called, you know, professional political sense, but like also want to be real about, you know, um, the, cir- the circumstances for a lot of people, you know, I don't know. Um, and I mean, I can understand her taking the job. I mean, I can also understand people being like her mom being like, are you crazy, you know, to do that. But um, maybe it was a little bit of a what do you call that like like a like a naivety and thinking that maybe she would actually you know do something good for the city maybe and we were talking about like her guilt of not being there during the storm so maybe this is maybe she was thinking I can't remember if she says this or not so (laughs) but like oh this will be a way for you know I'll be working in government and I'll be able to like make up for my guilt of not being there I don't think she ever explicitly says that but I feel like that's that's at least the implications I got from this role, which, yeah. And then it kind of leads to this question. So have you ever taken action to change the city's infrastructure? And if you did, what steps did you take? Because she seemed to be mostly interested in the road home program, which was, as she says here, generally agreed to be a massive failure. which I think she recognized that she alone couldn't change that. So she left after, I think, six months of being in this role. The only thing close to that that I did was when I was living in the ninth ward after uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, they were trying to turn this one little corner store that we had, because we didn't have, of course, no grocery stores, right? <laughs> they And they were applying for a liquor permit. And so I tried to that was my first and only time ever trying to like fight against that. I was like, hey, we need fresh produce. We need groceries. We don't need a, a liquor store, you know, seeing how people in the area are, were already impacted by drugs and alcohol. Um, I was like completely shut down, you know. <laughs> I, I went to the store for like this little pub, you know, it was like this whole little puppet show. Like they were like, oh, this is gonna be a public hearing. You can voice your, how, how you feel. And I tried to get as many people as I could to come, which was only like three or four people, but, I was actually shut down by the people in the store. They were like, if you don't like it, you don't have to come here. I was like, all right. I live across the street, but all right, thanks. <laughs> it is what it is, you know, but I, that's what I was my only, you know, time trying to do something. Yeah, I know it can be very discouraging, but if, I mean, share more, if anyone has any other instances to share, please do. And if there are any encouraging instances of you helping to make a change in infrastructure, I'm sure everybody could use a little hope. (laughs) Um, Right now there are three hotels and three condo developments going up 
in my neighborhood in in the bywater from ah, yeah yeah no hotels zero to now three as well as these massive condo developments, including one that is going to get a gated private drive with units starting at $835,000 each. So I have gone to every single one of those meetings, like you said, that are all just kind of nice and phony BS. Like, yeah, we're listening to the public opinion. We're checking that box that we did this step Yet when every single resident is saying, we don't want this, and these structures are still being built with also not really addressing what are we doing about the fact that we have all one way streets that we can barely get down as it is because there's cars now parked on both sides. There are just so many more, you know, it's just issue on top of issue on top of issue. Um, yeah, it's been maddening. It's been absolutely maddening, frustrating, and feeling helpless because, you know, money talks and all those developers have money. And what do, do we as residents have? You know, we, we have our homes that, that we take pride in and a neighborhood and a community that we desperately want to preserve. And, you know, thinking, back to the theme of value of who determines the value of a place um you know it just feels like the residents have no value and the only value of our place is what can be exploited for tourism or like you know the, the idea though of of homes costing over eight hundred thousand dollars in a neighborhood where there are five train lines that converge i.e this neighborhood was never meant for that is is sickening and it feels like it never ends either sorry not uplifting no that's okay i mean i i've noticed those big developments going at least one of the ones thank caught and wondering when and what that what like when it was supposed to be finished and what it even was so i'm thank you for you know letting us know that that's even happening so if i don't live in the neighborhood i'm not really aware of that but yeah i mean community organization can be powerful for sure but yeah ultimately it seems to be a, a barrier at some point that even large, good, organized movements can't seem to break. So I don't know. I don't, I also don't really have a hugely hopeful note to end this on, but does anyone else have any experience with changing infrastructure? It can be as small as adding a speed bump somewhere or taking out a speed bump somewhere. <laughs> I got them to fill in the hole in front of my house. Yay! <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the good examples. Yes. Yeah, there is road work being done, I've noticed, uh, around my area, which is great. Hopefully it, hopefully it lasts. Yay! <laughs> yeah. All right. Final thoughts? Anybody on the movement, the book, the in general, what we've been talking about. I feel like I need to go reread everything with how, how you related the movement to the movement of water. Oh, <laughs> I am not a musical person. So I think that's why, and I am deeply a water person. That's why I, I did not even think about like a symphony movement. So, yeah. Caroline, thank you so much for all of the <laughs> thought and time and energy you put into this. This was amazing. Thank you, Snaps, for Caroline. Doing this. Thank <laughs> you all for joining us. And thank everyone for participating. If you did speak, if you didn't speak, thank you for being here. Um, when is the next movement talk in August? 
Yes, August 19th, we'll wrap up this book as a community read for the discussions. Of course, we're still doing events around it until December. But in between them, we've got some really cool stuff coming up on June 26th. At the beginning, I told you guys about how we get books to the programs for adult education. And on June 26th, this is virtual. You can tune in on our YouTube channel. We're gonna be the co-host of the 14th annual adult education graduation, which will celebrate all of the adults in the greater New Orleans area who have passed their high set exam and earned their high school diploma this year. So tune in at that at 10 o'clock a.m. Central Time. That's 8 a.m. for you West Coasters. So have a cup of coffee and cheer on the graduates. And then for those of you in New Orleans on the 27th, come by Happy Raptor Distilling from four to seven. They're doing a little happy hour to benefit One Book One New Orleans. So drink some rum and part of the proceeds come back to us. Happy hour at Happy Raptor. In July, I believe we're aiming for July 8th, we'll be on the Lafitte Greenway with an interactive wall talking about what is home. And then as Caroline said in August, August 19th, we'll be right back here on Zoom with a community book discussion for Movement 4. So I look forward to seeing you guys at all of those and do not hesitate to find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube if you have questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was awesome.